Hello and welcome to the latest episode of Talking Together. Today we are at the Institution of Civil Engineers, joined by the lovely Anusha Shah, who is the current president of the institution. Thank you so much for joining us today to take part in this Talking Together initiative with the IMECI. I'm so delighted. Thank you so much for inviting me. So seeing all that you've achieved is incredibly inspiring to myself and I'm sure many others. Thank you. Was, what was the number one thing that inspired you or was there a particular person that inspired you? I would say both, actually. So what's been inspiring me is, I think, the power of an individual like us, like mm -hmm. me, uh, the power of making a positive difference. Mm -hmm. I think I don't see any walls. I see that whatever time is you have on this planet and your life, there is something you will do and that something is going to be very important Amazing. and in terms of people i would say um, my parents um, because my father uh, he was a son of a very wealthy man in kashmir but he actually branched out because he wanted to be a filmmaker mm -hmm. so at 13 he left home and he was a self-made man everything that he did was because of what he believed in yeah. and the resilience he had. So yeah. that's taught me things that nothing is unachievable. And the second is my mom. My mom uh, taught in Presentation Convent School where I was and she won the Best Teachers Award by oh. the governor. Yeah. But more than that, she, she was a mom and a teacher. Plus she looked after four children while doing a very hectic job at Presentation mm -hmm. Convent. It was a very full on job. So whenever I feel like, oh God, I've got a lot on my plate, I think of my mom. I'm like, when she could bring four children with a full time job, I think I don't have a reason to complain. So I think those two figures have been very inspiring in my life. Reading about all that you've achieved, being the first female and youngest person to chair the Institution of Civil Engineers Regional Committee, and then going on to be the first person from mm. ethnic origin and the third female to become president of the Institution of Civil Engineers. Mm. It's so inspiring. Could you Thank tell you. us if you've ever experienced imposter syndrome and if you did, how you were able to overcome it? Whenever I push myself to be in um, either positions or meetings or projects uh, which were beyond my reach, I have I've gone in with thinking that there will be people who don't want me there and there'll be people who will encourage me. Mm -hmm. So I think I've chosen to focus on people who've encouraged me and I've kind of learned to ignore people who are the naysayers. Mm -hmm. In fact, the naysayers, whatever they've said or done, it has pushed me even further. Mm -hmm. So in a way, I have learned to manage imposter syndrome by being mentally prepared for it. Is that um, a mindset that you've always had? Or is it something that you have to develop after seeing that there are people that might want to bring you down? I think the latter. Yeah. There have been times where clearly I've seen people who just, for some reason, mm. haven't wanted me to move forward. Yeah. But so at that point in time, um, you know, I'm talking about like 15, 20 years ago that mm -hmm. there wasn't a lot of talk on EDI, there wasn't mm -hmm. um, structures in place where you could discuss these things openly yeah so i took it on as this is how it is so yeah. i need to deal with it yeah. that didn't make it right mm -hmm. uh, when i look back uh, but i just dealt with it and i think that then helped me build that resilience mm -hmm. uh, but that's why i'm so passionate about the whole edi quality diversity inclusion agenda because what I've experienced and I'll face, I want to make sure that uh, women or people from ethnic minorities or people who come after me, I make it easy for them. Yeah, and paving the way, I guess, yes. making it easier so for making future it generations. Easier for, exactly. Yeah. At, least, at least they can concentrate on bigger things yeah. which matter yeah. and they're not um, diverted by things mm -hmm. that don't matter. That brings us on to another a similar question. Mm -hmm. So, have you seen a shift in the engineering industry's approach to the topic of mental health during your time working within it? Oh yes, absolutely. Mm. I think there's a, at least it's been acknowledged that there's work-life balance. Also the fact that you can spend 70, 80% of your time at work. So it's hugely important 
who you're spending that time mm -hmm. with, what kind of cultures are being given to you, what mm -hmm. kind of behaviors are of those people. Mm -hmm. Because being in a toxic culture impacts the rest of your life as well, which mm -hmm. impacts your personal life. Anything can happen in life. People can fall ill. Yeah. Um, you know, people could have divorce. There could be relationship issues. Yeah. You could have a child with special needs. Mm -hmm. Some of it can come in your day work mm -hmm. as well. And that's you as a person. So I think that acknowledgement of you as an individual who has different facets mm -hmm. is very, very important. Mm -hmm. There are days when you just don't feel well. Yeah. So it's like physical, you know, if, you, if you've if you got a cold and cough, you stay home, but mm -hmm. there are some days where you don't want to get out of bed because you're not mentally feeling well. Yeah. And I think that needs to be acknowledged as um, as, as, as any other illness. Yeah, um, so we are moving in the right direction, but there's still a long way to go. Yeah. Sounds promising and hopefully yes. if we continue the trajectory then it will be even greater for Absolutely. future generations. And the leaders have to, you know, create those cultures yeah. where people are given the psychological safety to say how they're feeling, Absolutely. exactly how they're feeling. Yeah. And feelings can never be right or wrong, it's how you're feeling. Yeah. So I think that needs to be acknowledged that, that bringing your authentic self and having those unfiltered conversations is very, very important. I can imagine with the great responsibility that you have, that you may end up in some situations that make you feel slightly stressed. Mm -hmm. How do you manage high pressure situations and prevent yourself from feeling burnt out or overwhelmed? Yeah, oh, there's so many days like that, as you can imagine. But I think my way of coping is um, I'm quite transparent with how I feel. Mm -hmm. So if there is a stressful situation, I will tell the person or the group exactly how I feel. I, and I don't bottle up things. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's in my personal relationship as well. Yeah. I just I, let, I just say it. I share it so yeah. that because it's always important that you, when you're in a situation, you're so sometimes you can't feel objective about it. You always feel it's the other person's fault and mm -hmm. you are in the clear. It's mm -hmm. not you, right? Mm -hmm. um, but then um, other people then put things in perspective and say, have you looked inwards? Maybe there was something that you contributed yeah. to it as well. Yeah. I think it is really important that people have the confidence as well to speak up in these situations. True. I think as a leader, it's equally as important to to empower your people to feel exactly. comfortable to speak up to you. Exactly. Because otherwise you can't then readjust yeah. boundaries and stuff Absolutely. like that. Absolutely. I think it's really That's why I really champion psychological safety. You yeah. know, there might be things I as a leader don't want to hear, mm -hmm. but I want to enable those environments where people can speak and say exactly what they are. And then yeah. I always prefer, and as with personal relationships, I think communication, effective communication is really good. Yeah. So if you're in my team and there's something that I haven't done right, I'd rather you let me know. Yeah. And then it uh, doesn't matter whether I'm your boss or not, yeah. we can work. Um, around it or yeah. equally if you have done something that I was expecting and there was mismanagement of expectations yeah. I would say it. It's having that dynamic mm -hmm. where you've got multiple perspectives you exactly. can never understand exactly what someone's feeling and what they're going through yeah. and how their day has been yeah, exactly. and maybe something's happened early in the day and they've just taken it out and you yeah. you just happen to be the first person they've met. What challenges and opportunities do you think there are within your industry for engineers of the future? I think the challenges are that um, unfortunately we are going to be living in a world where climate change is going to be getting worse if we don't do something about it. Mm -hmm. I, I think um, the world politics, uh, the geopolitics is um, it's getting unfortunately a little extreme. This is an, an, an opportune time to do something about it. Yeah. That's why making connections is such an important piece when I talk yeah. about it in my presidential theme. This is one point in history where it's one of the most exciting times where we get to reshape and repurpose cities yeah. uh, for everyone. Mm -hmm. You know, along the years, uh, yes, we've built cities, yes, we've built infrastructure, but that hasn't been for everyone. Health and well-being in harmony with nature is the central core. Mm -hmm. And that's so exciting. Yeah. And what's exciting is what you do in your professional life is actually going to impact your own family, your own yeah. future generations. Mm -hmm. So you, it's almost like you're in a profession that's actually helping you and your future generations. Yeah. 
And that's a massive opportunity. Literally how people used to be like indigenous populations mm -hmm. live in harmony with nature. Yeah. Because for them, nature is them and this nature is us, right? Yeah. That kind of a thing. So it's almost coming to a full circle of how societies used to live in the past, yeah. but with all the benefits of modern infrastructure, with all mm -hmm. the benefits of digital technology, which will make it easier for us. Mm -hmm. So I think the opportunities are massive. Yeah. But as long as I, as I say, keeping people and nature at the heart of solutions, you're not going to go wrong yeah. and ultimately w for whatever time we have on this planet is about health and well-being of us as people and our families and loved ones mm -hmm. and engineering is a huge enabler to make that happen what's not to like about it yeah definitely mm -hmm. I find it interesting that you say it would make housing it, it would you'd create housing for everyone mm -hmm. and there's focus on everyone and also social inequity mm -hmm. so what would having a harmonious um, nature integrated solution mm -hmm. how would that how would that enable us to deliver on those two things on social inequity and on housing for everyone I think it's about not building far too much because if you see there if if you look at the whole landscape you just have to look at holistically yeah there are so many assets stranded assets in countries yeah which are just lying empty okay. It's about how do you utilize those, you know, yeah. it could be schools, it could be derelict structures. Mm -hmm. You don't need to start from scratch. You mm -hmm. can repurpose assets yeah. and, and that could help in housing as well, right? In a way that you're having solar panels, you're having rainwater harvesting system. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe the new houses could have something where there's no waste. You know, the grey uh, water is being used to flush the toilets. So, mm -hmm. so I'm involved in some of these projects. Yeah. Um, so it's almost like a self-contained system. So not only is it helping to capture, carb you know, to reduce carbon, but you're building resilience for people. And we saw in COVID, yeah. you know, um, uh, and, and if, there is, if there is sudden energy power outage, but if you have some waste generated electricity in, in the housing area on its own. Yeah. So it's building that resilience. So it's quite exciting. It just needs a different mindset of decentralizing things. So you're not dependent on one single source. Yeah. So yeah. that's where social equity comes in. Yeah. If you're repurposing a lot of assets here, some of the countries that enable some of the countries to build that infrastructure. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so you have to look at it as one planet it's uh, you know one big family i know easier said than done but i think as infrastructure professionals in our projects through our projects getting that mindset is what is needed innovation has to be the creativity needs to be yeah. in repurposing assets working with nature having exhausting every nature-based solutions before you build it's about multifunctional infrastructure mm -hmm. because what that does is it opens multiple sources of funding as well yeah. And, and, and nature gives you that, and that fuels your green skills. So, you know, you've got skills, uh, you've got health and well-being, yep. uh, you've got the function, what you needed, whether it's housing, whether it's um, reducing carbon, whether it's slowing down water, whether it's um, cleaning the air. Yeah. So, so that's why we have to start thinking about the multifunctionality of infrastructure yeah. and nature has a big part to play in it Absolutely. Uh, so it's exciting it's so it's, so exciting and i think is. something that a lot of people are going to continue to show in, like interest in exactly. getting involved with. exactly it makes the whole engineering profession so exciting absolutely and thinking innovatively about combining those multi-functions exactly. of, of the projects is like it's what every engineer wants to do, exactly. you know, think creatively exactly. and work in harmony for, to serve a better purpose. And to be honest, I think personally it fills me with more confidence mm -hmm. living in a world that is so, so ever changing. Exactly. You know, and so it fluctuates so much. How, how powerful would it be to have a pool of people across the globe exactly, to, to reach out to yeah 100% that's exactly what it is things. because I think we need to not be um, tied up to old processes. Yeah. It needs a radical shift, yeah. the mindset shift. And, 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 and as I said, it's so exciting. Yeah. I think the future generation now, you guys, you've got the purpose right. Yeah. But I would say be bold. Yeah. If you think the process is not serving the purpose, change the process. Mm -hmm. Thank mm. you so much for speaking with us, Anusha. It's a pleasure. Before you leave, could you give us one final piece of information? Mm -hmm. If you could go back in time and give yourself one piece of advice as an undergraduate, mm -hmm. what would it be? I think I would say kindness at the core. And I'll tell you why. I think be kind to yourself. 
know that things work out in the end mm -hmm. and if things haven't worked out there's a reason um, mm -hmm. sometimes you have to take three four steps backwards to move forwards mm -hmm. uh, at that point in time you worry a lot so I tell my younger self not to worry you're on the right path mm -hmm. um, as long as kindness for people, kindness for nature, kindness to your own self. Because if you're not kind to yourself, you can't be kind to anyone else. Yeah. Um, so do that and trust your intuition. So Amazing. don't worry, be happy. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing, such a beautiful end to a very, very mm. insightful and powerful interview. Thank you so much, Manu. You've been a brilliant host. Thank you so such much. Such a pleasure to speak to you. And you. Thank you for Thank you so much. Thank you.